going to the Dairy Science Digest. This is a podcast designed to bring the Journal of Dairy Science straight to the ears of dairy producers. I'm Reagan Blue from the University of Missouri Dairy Team, and each month I feature a fresh new research article in press waiting to go to print. And for our May edition of this podcast, the research scientist Allison Kerwin joins us today from Cornell to discuss a two-part companion set article currently in press at the Journal of Dairy Science titled The Transition Cow Nutrition and Management Strategies of Dairy Herds in the Northeast. And so this is broken into two parts. The first part is really describing the herd and the performance characteristics. And then the second part associates the metabolic and inflammation parameters that they analyzed in the blood and related them back to health, milk, and reproduction success of the herds. So before we really get going, could you please introduce yourself to our audience? Absolutely. Well, first off, thank you very much for having me today. It's always a pleasure to be able to talk about this work, and especially since it did <laughs> it did take up a bit of time. <laughs> um, so it's always nice to actually share all the results. So I am transitioning into a research associate position at Cornell University. Uh, this work was actually part of my PhD that I wrapped up back in November. And it's been great being able to go to all these different farms and see different management styles and everything else. And overall, I, I would like to say that I was very impressed with the level of detail and the management on all of these farms that I went to. Absolutely. And so listeners, uh, th just to summarize it a little bit, of these 72 farms, they were uh, categorized in the Northeast, but primarily New York and Vermont. And this data was collected from 2012 through 2015. And really the criteria focused around they needed to be a Holstein herd. They needed to be a herd of greater than 400 cows and free stalls with TMR and lots and lots of data. And they needed to be willing to capture some health events through this transition period. And, you know, uh, let's just address this elephant in the room for some of the listeners. You might have been thinking just now, Whoa, wait a minute. Uh, you said greater than 400 cows. And, and honestly, the data set had a median number of 900 cows per herd. Could you address the elephant in the room? Is this information even applicable to herds of 100 to 200? Or could you talk a little bit about why, through statistics, you needed to go with these larger herds? Absolutely. So first question, yes, I would definitely say this data applies to smaller herds as well. But in order for us, as far as the statistics and everything, we do need a larger herd size though, so that we can capture, so we can take samples from a larger group of cows. Our goal was to take um, blood samples from 12 to 24 cows for each farm. And we strive to take a third of those blood samples from Primi Paris cows and the rest from Ulta Paris cows to reflect her demographics. But again, it's just for the statistics aspect of things, we needed to get a representative sample from each farm. Um, and that would give us enough power to make some of the inferences that we, that we did. Okay. And so, so you alluded to the fact that you went to these farms to collect a, a very comprehensive survey. Could you explain why did you go to the farms instead of just mailing out some surveys? So we visited each farm four times. So at my first scheduled farm visit, that's typically when we went over the survey and I had the farmer either fill it out. And sometimes I would, I would email it to them ahead of time so they could fill it out. I would review it, ask any additional questions if I needed, if something wasn't clear, but it was all part of our, our data collections. The first visit, I basically followed the same cohort of cows for each visit. The first visit was focusing on the cows when they were in the far off dry period. And then we came back a few weeks later and saw them when they were in the, the close up and then the fresh and then the high lactating periods. So, so you visited all of these herds over an 11 week period. And I want to emphasize something that you just kind of breezed right through. You talked about this cohort. And I think this is a really important part of this project where you took this group of animals 
the same group of animals and followed them through this 11 week period. We followed the same cohort of cows from the far off period through the high lactating period. We only took blood samples from those cows on the close up and the fresh period. The idea was we have all this information on that cow. So we, at each visit, we collected body condition and locomotion scores from the cow. But we also, and we're also looking at nutrition and the management of these farms and these cows as well. So the pen level stuff as well. So like stocking density, feeding frequencies, but again, also the nutrition. So whether they're feeding a controlled energy diet or not controlled energy diet, but again, that's kind of the, the follow-up work. We're still working on getting that, that work published. So that's why we wanted to follow the same cohort of cows from that far off period all the way through the high lactating period. So we have data on the individual cow, but we also have data on their environment as well. So your team measured a vast variety of parameters across all of these farms, ranging from stall size to pin dynamics, stocking density, water trough availability. Which were a few of the parameters measured in the infrastructure that you really think had the strongest impact on success of these 72 hertz? Oh gosh, that's that's a really tough question because I really I really don't believe that there was any one parameter that really attributed to success. I think it's I think a lot of it is a combination of things. Um, I think the biggest thing is trying to minimize stress for mm. these cows. So. Um, you know, there's been some work and, you know, the Minor Institute has kind of shown this um, that, you know, you, you think about even in our daily lives, right? Like we as humans can take some stress and we're fine, right? Mm -hmm. But you keep adding, it's like a bunch of building blocks, making a tower out of building blocks, right? You stack mm -hmm. one stressor on top of one another and eventually it's going to crumble and it's going to fall. And that's mm -hmm. just like the cow, right? You keep adding a bunch of these different stressors to the cow and eventually she's going to crash. So I really strongly believe that it's not just one thing. It's, it's managing all the different stressors. And again, some cows can take some things, mm -hmm. but you give them too much and, and that's where you're going to run into some issues. Right. Yeah. Um, so I do think it's worthwhile to first just talk about these herds in general. I mean, these were high producing, really well managed herds. Looking at the, the herd incidence of some of these health disorders, mm -hmm. in the state of New York, we have a thing called the New York State Cattle Health Assurance Program. It's basically a group establishing or, or giving these achievable rates as far as these different health events. And mm -hmm. I'll say that our mean health events were for the most part, below the nice chap achievable rates. So, you know, we only had 1.9% of DAs, 1.2% um, of milk fever, 6.5% of retained placentas, right? You know, fairly low incidence of, of a lot of these negative health disorders. The majority of farms milked their fresh cow pens at least three times a day. Mm -hmm. But as far as different health management, I did find a few things to be really interesting. One, we still had about 12 to 14% of herds that vaccinated their cows, either in the maternity or calving pen, or mm -hmm. the first pen that the cow moved into after partrition. So that, you know, most times that's like a fresh pen or like a sick pen temporarily before they can actually move on. So could you expand why, why should producers not do that? So it's actually, it's been advised to avoid that practice and there really isn't much research on it, but the idea being that you're vaccinating this cow, you're stimulating inflammatory response basically. And that can potentially lead to a cow being diagnosed as being sick when really she's just trying to handle the, this vaccination. So you might see a, a drop in dry matter intake or mm -hmm. increased temperature. And that's, you know, it's, that might be a typical response towards vaccinating. But again, thinking about these stressors, this cow just had a calf or she's about to calve. And here you right. are trying to stimulate an inflammatory response. Is that necessarily the best thing for the cow at the time? Probably, Probably not. not. No. Maybe there's yeah. a better time when we can really, when we can vaccinate these cows that isn't going to be so stressful on the cow. 
and again, this this actually kind of ties into some of my work, um, the management paper that that we're currently trying to publish. We actually do show an association between herds that did vaccinate in one of these pens. They did have elevated haptoglobin concentrations or a higher, oh, greater wow. prevalence of haptoglobin concentrations, which again, not surprised, right? It makes sense. Right. So that's one thing. Another thing that I find really interesting is looking at commingling primiparis and multiparis cows in a pen. So during the high lactating period and the far off dry cow period, that's where we had the least pens that commingled. But the close up period and the fresh period, that's where we had the most of the herds commingled during that time. You're looking at 68 to 72 percent of farms commingled in during those periods. And again, those now, are wait a minute, wait a minute. That's not textbook. We're not supposed to be commingling there, right? <laughs> Correct, right? I mean, that's that's what they say, right? Uh -huh. But again, that's that's what we've been told, but again, there's very little research to actually back that up. Right. Um, so, you know, a lot and this is this was part of the project. This was the part of the, the point of this project was to look at those management factors and actually relate it to some of these outcomes because there, there really is little data looking at these things. Um, it's so easy as a researcher to march around and say, well, you know, theoretically, you ought to be segregating these animals. But if you don't have data to back it up, it's, it's really just empty. Right? Exactly. And, and here we have these farms that some of them are not doing it successfully, but a lot of them are. And, um, and I think that that's what was so fascinating about this part one of, of your research project, looking at what are those things that folks deviated from the textbook and their management techniques from these common practices, you know, what, what worked? And like you were saying, I recognize that, that some of them could be that foundational minimization of stress. And, and could we get away with X as long as you're not doing Y and finding that sweet spot to manage the system of the transition? It's, it's profound. Exactly. So, right. I mean, a lot of the recommendations that ex that exist are either based off of field experience mm -hmm. or it's data that we get from small controlled research trials that we're then trying to apply out in the field. Mm -hmm. But again, there's, there's a lot of limitations to those small controlled research trials. Typically, those trials are looking at one management factors and they're trying to minimize all the other factors that could cause stress in the cow. She's a complicated beast. It's too complicated. There's a web. <laughs> right. And, and again, you think of, you know, those building blocks. Well, are we really going to be able to evaluate commingling, for example, in a group of cows when we're not stressing them with anything else? Right. You know, what, what are the, how, how is that really affecting the cow? We don't really know. And that's kind of the advantage of this study. We're able to look at, at all these herds that obviously have a lot of different stressors on the farm and hopefully the ones that have the biggest influence on some of these outcomes are going to come out in the analysis and, and give us some insight. So it's a really profound statistical analysis of a massive data set that's giving us a lot of information and, and insight. And I think before we go to the blood parameter side of things and, and some of uh, these herd level alarms, could you take a moment, I suspect most of our listeners have heard about MIFAs or non-esterified fatty acids, and the same with uh, beta-hydroxybutyrates. But maybe they haven't really heard much about haptoglobin. Could you, could you talk about why you guys were tracking haptoglobin in the transition period? And what was your hypothesis around that? So haptoglobin is an, an inflammation marker. It's an acute phase protein um, that typically is at acute levels. It really is non, it's essentially non-existent in the cow. Um, until some kind of inflammatory event occurs, and then it can increase over a hundredfold. Um, so that's the interesting thing about it. So, you know, you can take a blood sample from the cow, and if she's in the high lactating period, or if she's, there's nothing going on, haptoglobin should 
really shouldn't even pop up in that blood sample. So the fact that we're finding haptoglobin in these blood samples, that means that there's some kind of inflammatory event that's mm-hmm. stimulating that acute phase response. And we can see, especially in, in that early lactation period, we can see an increase in haptoglobin concentrations for many different reasons. It, it can occur in the transition cow due to tissue damage that's associated with parturition, mm-hmm. uh, uterine infection, we think of metritis, insults to the gastrointestinal tract causing mm-hmm. gastrointestinal barrier dysfunction. And there's even been some thoughts that it could be increased potentially through the infiltration of excessive NIFA in the liver. Mm. Um, and in addition, thinking about these management aspects as well, previous research has also demonstrated that haptoglobin concentrations can increase in cows and calves as a result of a stressful event such as transportation. Mm. Um, so some of some of our previous work um, by Dr. Huzzy has actually shown that you know an increase in haptoglobin concentrations is associated with decreased milk and de- poor reproductive performance as well. So we wanted to to kind of take this another step forward. And our idea with haptoglobin here is it's a different marker that we might be able to evaluate that might be more related to some of the management side of Mm. things, um, such as stocking density. Again, some of these stressors that might cause an inflammatory response in the cow, um, or, you know, maybe it's related to the diet. All of a sudden the cow freshens and she's put onto this really high starch (laughs) diet, right? That's, that's, you know, causing the gastrointestinal barrier dysfunction, right? And allowing LPS to, get through and cause inflammatory response, yeah. right? Right. So there, there's several different things. So um, it's a different marker that's not, you know, it's not indicative of the NIFAs or BHBs that we that we've looked at in the past. Um, and it can indicate some other things going on with the cow. So that's what our interest was. Um, and again, previous research has looked at haptoglobin before, and there's a strong relationship with haptoglobin and metritis, for instance. Mm-hmm. Um, and previous work has looked at trying to establish thresholds. We, we typically hear of one gram per liter. That's some of Dr. Huzzy's work. And again, that's kind of associated with a greater risk of metritis. But we have a uterine infection. Okay, acute phase response is initiated and haptoglobin is being produced. So we typically see haptoglobin is typically elevated somewhere between like three and eight days of milk. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it starts to wean off a little bit. But that's not to say that you still won't have cows with really high haptoglobin concentrations further out. And they realistically have something something going on. That's, that's really fascinating. And I had not tracked haptoglobin very much. And so it it caught me wanting to chase more information on it. So talk a little bit about the fresh cow checks. I I found it quite interesting. Also complimentary of these 72 herds, 95.8% of them did fresh cow checks. And, And that fresh cow check probably looked a little bit different depending on the herd, but all of them were working on the herd early days in milk to identify any animals struggling. Do you, do you have any insight on, on fresh cow checks and what, what do you think are important parameters to be looking at or, or ways you go about analyzing those, those fresh cows? I can't say that I have too much insight as to what a dairy producer should really do when evaluating their fresh cows. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest thing is more the amount of time that you're locking that cow up uh, to perform those best for the cow. Um, So we really do try and strive to lock up those fresh cows for no more than an hour per day. Again, that's that's kind of the recommendation. We had 15% of our herds locked their fresh cows up for more than an hour every single day. Mm -hmm. Um, And there, there was actually one or two herds that locked up their fresh cows twice within a day. Um, so again, you know, how, how beneficial is that? I can potentially understand if you're really having a lot of fresh cow issues, I could definitely understand locking up those cows. Again, you don't want to do it more than an hour per day, but at least on a daily basis, I could understand why, because you want to try and identify those sick cows as, as quickly as possible, but you're not having much 
for negative health disorders within the herd, you're doing really good as far as transition, cow management, everything. It may not be necessary to spend a lot of time keeping those cows locked up and checking right. them over. Um, Less is more. Exactly, right? So just trying to get them back into their normal routine, I think, is the biggest thing. We want to try and get them to that point as quickly as possible, trying to get them so that they're comfortable, again, minimizing those stressors. So maybe minimizing or reducing our stocking density within that fresh mm -hmm. cow pen, you know, making sure that we're feeding those cows. We're not feeding an empty bunk at all, making sure that they always have access to fresh feed, I think is, is really going to be uh, most beneficial. I did find it interesting on the stocking density comment that you just had um, that by and large folks were were honoring that hundred percent for the fresh cow pen, even though sometimes we talk a little about about maybe even having a little less than hundred percent. It was one hundred two, and but the far off being ninety eight and the close up at ninety eight. So we had the close up pen slightly understocked, but the high pen would routinely average a uh, hundred and twenty percent. And I think that that's a, another one of those experience will tell us over time where that sweet spot is. Um, and, and it could look different to each and every herd. What I am most fascinated with this article about, or this pair of articles, is, is that you guys looked at each and every one of them in a system. And it it's a tool, this very robust document it can serve as a tool for nutritionists and large animal veterinarians and, and your team of individuals coming together to look at specific parameters um, and then think systematically about it. So could you could you please take a minute to talk a little bit about these biomarkers that you were analyzing? So that's going to be NEFA, beta hydroxybutyrate, and haptoglobin. Can you associate those to the health of the dairy herd and maybe how does that health and inflammation how does that impact our our milk yield that we expect or or the reproductive success of the herd absolutely so the interesting part about this study was um during the prepartum period, we only analyzed NEFA concentrations. We didn't look at any other biomarkers during that time. Um, and previous work has demonstrated that elevated prepartum NEFA concentrations are associated with several different health disorders, such as clinical ketosis, metritis. But with our model, we did not observe, we did not identify a threshold at all with any of those disorders, except for culling within 30 days of milk, um, which is actually an, an outcome that hasn't really been looked at all that much in the past. Just this is kind of a follow-up study to the Aspina study that really was the first one to establish different thresholds for NEFAs and BHBs. So either way, we, we did identify one threshold that was associated with culling within 30 days of milk. However, the threshold that we identified was much lower than any of the thresholds identified with the Aspina work. And we think that this is partially due to a couple things. One, we think that there has been an improvement in the nutritional management with these herds. And I think the Aspina study really set that up. You know, dairy producers, nutritionists, they were more focused on monitoring BHBs and taking a look at some of these different biomarkers. And even though we only had five to nine years between data collection for the Aspina study and our study, we still saw a lower prevalence of elevated prepartum NEFAs concentrations in this in this data set, in this cohort of, of farms that we observe. So that does tell me that, you know, the management has improved. And I think part of that is related to the foundation work that the Espina study really did. I could just pause right there and just make a general comment. And I think it's really appropriate on this educational podcast to take a moment to applaud dairy men who care and researchers that are making the difference. All right, guys. So what she is saying is that this 2013 paper from Ospina had data that was saying, hey, guys, you need to really pay attention to this. And so you heard that message. You made the change. And now the research 
was impacted by it because your herd was impacted by the research. And isn't that what land grant universities are all about? Is just creating this data that you need to have to make your your life more successful. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just think it's really empowering as a researcher and as, as a dairy scientist to provide these solutions and to provide this data that dairy producers can trust. And, and that's what it's all about. That That's what makes our heart pitter patter, I think, if I were to be so bold to speak for you. <laughs> Absolutely. But that's what we're here for. We've committed our life to it. So sorry to no, no, thank you very much. No, I, I, I totally agree with you. It's, it is, it's truly fascinating. And, and honestly, the turnaround time, the fact that it was five, five to nine years, right? That's, yeah. that's pretty incredible. Um, you know, but right. I mean, we just, we didn't see, there weren't as many cows that had elevated prepartum nephid concentrations. So we didn't observe those same associations in this study as with the Espina work. But you know, for for the other markers, we we did observe an association between uh, the different negative health disorders and elevated postpartum nephas, BHBs, and haptoglobin. Now, as far as milk goes, for for nephas, cows with elevated nephid concentrations in the postpartum period, multiparous cows, those cows had decreased. 305 day mature equivalent milk yield. So multiparous cows with elevated postpartum NEFA concentrations produced less 305 day mature equivalent milk. Um, and our modeling shows 280 kilograms. But premiparous cows with elevated NEFA concentrations actually produced more milk, almost 450 kilograms more milk. So all of that really blows my mind. So why why in the world do the m mature cows lose 600 pounds of milk, whereas the, the first calf heifers gain almost 1,000 pounds for that lactation? How do you explain that with elevated prepartum needs? It's hard to know for certain because I think we would have to take blood samples that also analyze other markers as well. But we're basically attributing it to different homeoretic responses. These primiparous cows, they're still growing. They have different demands. They're mobilizing different tissues differently than the multiparous cows. So that's what we're kind of attributing to, just the differences and the, the homeoretic differences between multiparous and primiparous cows. So additionally, primiparous cows that had elevated BHB concentrations greater than 0.9 millimoles per liter, they produced more milk as well, 552 kilograms yeah. more 305 day mature equivalent milk. 1200 pounds. Yep. Sorry, yep. I always bring nope. back to Thank pounds you. just for those <laughs> 1200 pounds of milk. Could you tell me a little bit about the, the milk response relative to the behydroxybutyrates? Sure. So for, for multiparous cows, we actually we did not observe an association between <laughs> elevated BHBs with milk. However, this kind of threw me for a loop. I was kind of surprised that we didn't. Yeah. Um, so because we didn't observe this milk response at all, I, I wanted to investigate this a little more. So I basically looked at a range of BHB thresholds from 0.7 to 1.5. And part of this was actually just due to my initial modeling work. I did originally observe an association with BHB and multiparous cows for the milk. It was using a, a really low threshold of like 0.7 millimoles per liter. Mm -hmm. And then due to reviewer comments, we kind of adjusted our analysis and got a completely a, a different, different result. So we didn't observe an association. However, you know, the fact that we actually, we did see a positive milk response using that 0.7 millimole per liter threshold for multiparous cows. So Cows that had a BHB threshold of at least 0.7 millimoles per liter produced 363 kilograms more ME305 milk, um, which again, this was very different than a lot of the Espina work. First of all, well, it, was a low, it was a lower threshold, but mm -hmm. also a positive milk response, which, you know, typically we think of elevated right. BHBs, we think of negative milk. So I wanted to I wanted to investigate this a little more. So what I did is I, uh, similar to uh, 
the Chapinel approach, another study that kind of looked at these different thresholds, um, we, I basically increased the BHB threshold by 0.1 millimoles per liter. So I looked at thresholds from 0.7 to 1.5. And we basically see this inflection point at 1.2 millimoles per liter, where all of a sudden from 0.7 to 1.2, yes, we're producing more milk, but that that amount of milk decreases until we get to 1.2 and then mm. it switches. So then looking at thresholds above 1.2, now we're seeing a more negative milk response. More typical. Mm -hmm. Right. So cows that had a BHB threshold of at least 1.5 millimoles per liter, those cows produced 376 kilograms less milk than cows that had a BHB threshold less than 1.5 millimoles per liter. I see. So it's, it's kind of reiterating this idea of not all BHBs are bad. <laughs> BHBs right. are actually good. Um, a source of energy. Yeah. Exactly. These fresh cows are relying on some BHB to help meet their energy demands. But when it's an excess, yes. that's when it's, that's when it's not good. That's when we start to see these deleterious effects, right? Um, it's all about moderation. Exactly, exactly. So, right, some is okay. <laughs> um, and, you know, I would kind of argue, you know, anywhere between, uh, anywhere up until that 1.2 millimoles per liter or mm -hmm. something, you know, I, I don't fret about it. And honestly, probably a good thing that cows have, <laughs> um, have some BHB because, right, that is- That means huge... she's working. Mm -hmm. Exactly, it means she's you working. Know. 800 pounds of milk is nothing to, to scoff at. And so kind of a, a balancing act associated with that. Absolutely. So how do these biomarkers relate to the reproduction success of, of the dairy herd? At least at the cow level, essentially, I, we observed an association between postpartum NIFA concentrations only for multiparous cows with a uh, risk of conception within 150 days of milk. So those cows with elevated postpartum NIFA concentrations had a decreased risk, a 20% decreased risk of conceiving within 150 days of milk. Cows that had at least a 1.1 millimole per liter BHB concentration also had a 20% decreased risk of conceiving within 150 days of milk. Cows with elevated haptoglobin concentrations greater than 0.45 grams per liter had a 28% decreased risk of conceiving within 150 days of milk. So again, I mean, <laughs> kind of going back to this you know, if we have these increase, these elevated levels, we are going to have decreased performance, reproductive performance. And haptoglobin was the only biomarker that had an association with pregnancy risk at first service. So mm -hmm. cows with elevated haptoglobin concentrations were less likely of, cons of becoming pregnant at that first service. Um, I think that data supports inflammation, just prohibits that from really happening. Um, and, and looking at the median time for pregnancy, the range between these three, median time for pregnancy ranging from 114 to 117 for NEFAS elevated versus mm -hmm. uh, beta hydroxybutyrate at 107 versus 115. But it's those haptoglobin that's really capturing the, the inflammation mm -hmm. response where you've got a full two-week window or 15-day differential between the median pregnancy um, for, for that herd. And so, again, managing that stress and the inflammation mm -hmm. through the period is is really an important detail. And recall that these, these numbers are generated from your, your close-up herd and fresh cow herd. So we're really looking exclusively at a two-week window right around calving, dictating whether or not she's getting pregnant 60 days later. I, I just find that fascinating. Absolutely. So when, when dairy producers are, are working with their nutritionists and their, and their large animal veterinarian or even their extension agent and they're, they're working on these herd alarms and they're motivated to making some changes and, and drawing some blood samples, what, what are some different benchmarks that we really need to be looking at? If you're having trouble in your transition pen, what are some alarm levels? I'll focus at least on the herd alarm levels that were associated with disorder incidents. And we were looking at displaced abomasums, clinical ketosis, or, or a combination of both. Um, that was our definition for disorder incidents. 
for prepartum MIFA concentrations, herd, herds that had at least 30% of their multiparous cows with a prepartum NIFA concentration of at least 0.17 millimoles per liter, they had a 6%, 6 percentage unit increase in their disorder incidence. For postpartum NIFA. Let's, let's break that down for just a minute, if you could be so kind. So let's hypothetically say that you are working with a dairy herd that has come to you and said, Ms. Allison, please help us. We're having so much trouble with this transition period. How would you help them shape a blood sampling regimen? What is the current recommendation for how to evaluate these biomarkers in, in your transition herd? So in our study, and I think this is kind of the, the common recommendation uh, to give you enough power, enough confidence in your results. Obviously, the more cows you sample, the better, but that also could be cost prohibitive as well and may not make sense. So we typically try and take 12 samples from 12 to 24 cows. Again, in, in our sample, we were looking at primiparous and multiparous cows. So, you know, if we were taking 24 samples, eight of those samples were coming from primiparous cows. So it just depends on if you want to look at premium Paris cows at the same time, but I would look at 12 to 24 animals. If it was a smaller herd and you were only able to get 12 cows that were between that three to 14 days of milk window, mm -hmm. you know, this would basically mean, you know, four, if you had four of those 12 cows that had a prepartum NIFA concentration of at least 0.17 millimoles per liter, that would indicate that you're at a greater risk of Red flag. right. You're you're at a greater risk of yeah, an, yeah, an increased disorder incidence, right? So that's kind of how to interpret it. We typically say you know anywhere between 12, 12 to twenty four. The one the one downside with some of the stuff is NIFAs. You have to send a blood sample to a lab to get it analyzed. Right. BHB is the only one that we can analyze cow side. So mm -hmm. as far as looking at these different biomarkers, I would start with BHB. Mm -hmm. And I like it's the easiest one to measure if you think you're having issues that might give you some kind of indication as to what's going on. So that's the first one that I would go to just because it's easy to do. <laughs> you can do it. Cow side, mm -hmm. you get results right away. Um, and it's fairly inexpensive to do as well. So, right. you know, that's, that's where I would start. And then based off of those results, okay, maybe we also need to evaluate NIFAs. Um, you know, I would like to note there, there's no association between <laughs> NIFA concentrations and BHB. Surprisingly, there's, there's really no association. There's, there's been some work that was done by McCarthy et al. Actually that looked at that and, and there's nothing, which makes it really hard. Um, NIFA is really it's just absolutely incredible to me. I don't understand how they could not be correlated, <laughs> but I, I'm listening. I, it's just as amazing these energy parameters. The ah, oh, the cow's an amazing beast. It's all it's all based off of the way I see it. Is it's it's what are we giving the cow as far as glucogenic precursors? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, are we giving the cow enough where she can utilize those NIFAs, those mobilizing NIFAs? and put them into different things mm -hmm. or do we not have enough <laughs> of these precursors and therefore some of the NIFA needs to get converted to the BHBs and then we have mm -hmm. an energy source that way right right so that's that's part of it um but so NIFA really is going to be your biomarker that's really going to tell you the energy status of the cow that's that's really that's your that's standard. Um, but again yeah but again bhb is is going to be the cheapest the easiest to do and you'll get the fastest re results haptoglobin is a, is tricky <laughs> I'll, yeah. I'll just put that out haptoglobin we've we've had issues with haptoglobin as far as measuring it again it's it's a marker that you're only going to get analyzed in a lab. Not every lab analyzes haptoglobin, mm -hmm. um, and there's no gold standard. So mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, one lab might report one result, but then you go to a different lab and theirs might be slightly different. And that's because there's different assays. Wow. Um, huh. So we do have some issues with that. Also, the tube type that you use matters depending on the assay. So I was going to ask that. So is it primarily serum or... 
plasma. I highly, I highly recommend that if you're ever going to have blood samples analyzed for haptoglobin, use serum. Do not use plasma because some of our work has shown and, and Minor Institute worked with us on this as well. One of the assays that we use for analyzing haptoglobin concentrations, and I know some commercial labs use this kit, it's not valid on plasma. So you wow. need to use serum. Okay. Yep. Well, there you go. You know, again, we also have to think about, you know, our cow level results and then interpreting it into herd level results as well. Sometimes it's it's hard to make inferences. With our work, we're establishing thresholds on the cow level, and, you know, there is going to be some variation there. We're then trying to extrapolate those results into herd alarm levels as well, and that can, the accuracy may not be Mm -hmm. there as much as the cow level, right? Because realistically, the, the accuracy of the herd level test is, is uh, influenced by the sensitivity and the specificity of our cow level test. Each individual, um, yeah. Right. So there's normal biological variations and sample size constraints that kind of limit us a little bit with our herd alarm levels. Um, I think, though, listeners, if you're interested in these herd alarm levels, I'll go ahead and summarize those in the comments of the of the show, and so you can pull that right up. But of course, uh, Journal of Dairy Science is open access now, and so you guys can have full open access to all of these papers that we've been discussing today, because even these very well-managed, uh, high-producing dairy herds in, in Northeast United States, they had a really robust incidence rate of these high biomarkers. Um, 71% of these 72 herds had greater than 30% sampled with, with high pre nephas 61% had over 15% of nephas during that postpartum check. 46% had elevated beta-hydroxybutyrates and 90% had high uh, haptoglobin. And so this is not the end of the conversation. We've been working on the transition dairy cow for nearly four decades, but I do really believe that this this set of papers, and it sounds like another pair of papers coming out soon, are going to be foundational to uh, helping us understand to, and better manage the transition dairy cow pen for, for your herd. So, Dr. Kerwin, I, I want to thank you so much. This has been very informative, and I, I really appreciate your time. And listeners, I applaud you for taking time out of your day to learn about the intersection of your management and the successful transition dairy cow in, in your herd. So I really enjoyed our conversation, and in my humble opinion, these two papers will go down into history as being benchmarking goals for our herds moving forward. This has been the May edition of the Dairy Science Digest, a monthly podcast project designed to bring the Journal of Dairy Science straight to your ears. We highlight peer-reviewed research articles in press each month, sound science that you can base your management decisions around provided by your university Missouri dairy team. So be sure to like, share, and subscribe to get future editions straight to your cell phone. This is Regan Blue with the Dairy Science Digest, and I hope you have a great day.